listening to the City Church Podcast. We hope that you will be abundantly blessed by this message. If you would like to find out more about the city, please log on to our website, www.thecity.sg. All right. I have uh, a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, how many of you are excited for a series here? Yeah? You know, you know, I've been spelling the word honor wrong for a very long time. I spell without you, but you know, honor involves you. It's brilliant segue, Andre. It's amazing. <laughs> All right, let's pray before we, we, we get going, yeah? Okay? Awesome. Well, Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, even just read your word, God. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of uh, the scriptures, God, that which was uh, not, not even a present reality for the people in the Old Testament, but today because of uh, what you've purchased for us on the cross, we get to freely explore your word. And God, we believe, God, that every time we open the scriptures, God, that you are in that very words, that from these words, God, brings about life, brings about change, brings about transformation. God, I thank you that it is not by the eloquence of man, not by the ingenuity of man that lives are changed and transformed, but it's by your holy word, by your Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you will come, that you will grace us with your presence, and God, that you will cause that shift, that transformation in our hearts even this morning. We are expectant today to encounter you, not to encounter knowledge, not to encounter more information, but to encounter the very person of Christ. So that's why we're here today and we give you all the glory, all the praise for what you're about to do in the midst. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to go for it, yeah? Okay, we've got a lot of ground to cover. So you know what to do. If you are with me, just let me know you're with me. I said, oh yeah, I send love from PD. PD and Joy are overseas. They love you all. They have not abandoned you all and they are coming back. So, yes, you have me for the next few weeks. <laughs> One of my favorite passages in the Bible, if you haven't heard before, is Romans 12. It says, uh, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. And uh, how many of you know that salvation, though a phenomenal experience, does not mark the completeness of the transformation that God has for your life. Am that making sense? We can see every single person in Singapore saved, you know, say the prayer, be saved. But how many of you know that even in a nation full of saved people, there will still be problems? If tomorrow our government comes to a position and say, we are now a Christian nation, they put the Bible into our laws, they put it all in place, you know, and we are now a Christian nation, a nation under God. How many of you know that? Though that is phenomenal and awesome, but we will still have problems. Right? Salvation is not the end goal. Transformation is. We get saved when we believe in Jesus. We get transformed when we believe like Jesus. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation occurs when we begin to operate from a different belief system. Transformation occurs when we shift and move ourselves out of the old ways of thinking into new ways of thinking. And thinking doesn't just stop there. Thinking produces belief system, it produces action, it produces principles, core values, belief systems, and it changes the way you live. Do not be conformed to the old ways of doing things, but be of a different kingdom, be of a different realm. Transformation, is that, that's how that happens. You know, I, I am possessed with this uh, endeavor, and that is to discover what... Um, you know, I, I think the, the Christian life is marked by two pursuits. One, the pursuit of my life as a Christian is to become more like Jesus. And that's why I read the Bible. That's why we talk about the scriptures. You know, we, we long to discover how Jesus responded to different situations. What are the core values? What are the things that Jesus cared about? And model them and become more like Jesus. The goal of the Christian is to be more like Jesus. But there is another pursuit, and that is this. The goal of my life as a disciple, as a follower of Christ, is to cause this planet to look more like His world. His will, His heart, is sum up in this prayer that we often affectionately refer to as the Lord's Prayer. My suggestion to you is that's not the Lord's Prayer because in it is the confession of sin. 
and the Lord is without sin. It's the disciples' prayer. And it's the prayer that you and I are called to live from, called to walk out. And in that prayer is the very heart of God. The disciples asked, Lord, how shall we pray? And he said this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need to be on that pursuit of causing this world to look like more, to look more like his. And that process, that endeavor is marked by this thing called transformation. And transformation only occurs when you change the way you think that, and it reflects into the way you operate, into the way you live. Am I making sense? Yeah. I think I am. You know, I, I, I am stirred by you know, some of these revival stories. Um, I remember... Um, a reading about the Welsh Revival at one point. And uh, it says this in the Welsh Revival, it says that the bars will be empty, the police stations will be closed down, the atmosphere was so pregnant with the presence of God, people would get saved in the streets. You know, police stations, the policemen would be out of job because there's there no, virtually no crime. Everyone was in church, everyone was praying. That was the atmosphere of the Welsh Revival. That was heaven on earth. It says this in the Jesus People movement that people will be on these drug trips. They'll be so high on drugs, on alcohol, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of God will come upon individuals and they'll instantly sober it up. And all of a sudden, they'll, 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 they'll feel this longing and feel this uh, drawing in their heart and they will walk randomly almost, you know, and they'll find themselves at... Uh, and this phenomenon occurred for a bunch of people. They'll find themselves at the, the doors of different houses. They'll knock on the doors and uh, the homeowner will open and these drugged out hippies with no shoes and long hair, they will ask the question like, what must I do to be saved? And they will find, and, and this was a, a common occurrence. People would, would go into doors, would, would encounter strangers, and they'll ask the question, what must I do be, to be saved? A very famous conversion uh, that happened was a, a man named Keith Green. That was how Keith Green was converted. Keith Green was on a drug trip. He instantly sobered up. He was led to go to a house. He knocked on the door and he was like, how must I, what must I do to be saved? That was how Keith Green got saved. And Keith Green, we, we know, wrote countless songs that the body of Christ still sings today. Yeah. Name me one song. Huh? Make my life a prayer to you. I want to do. Wow, amazing song. That was how Keith Green got, got converted. And to me, you know, stories like this, you know, um, though impressive, though uh, you know, very fun to read about, it does stir me... Um, Maybe differently from some of you, but when I look at these stories, it makes me think of the possibilities. Yeah. That it is possible, it is not just something that uh, God uh, intends for a previous generation. The kingdom only moves in one direction, from glory to glory. We read about uh, Moses, we read about the glory of God present in the days of Moses. You know, the, God will appear visibly, a fire by night, a cloud by day, you know, and there'll be such visible manifestations of the glory of God. And we all know that the old covenant was an inferior covenant. The new covenant, it's, it's much better. The question is, why have we allowed a belief system that seems to uh, be okay with an inferior covenant bearing superior returns, if you will, or looking better than what we have today? If the kingdom is supposed to go in this direction, then shouldn't we see greater manifestations of his glory? Shouldn't this covenant, shouldn't this life be, uh, be our experiences be something that the people of old would be, would be longing, would be pining for? Am I making sense? No, we have to move ourselves out of a place of like, oh yeah, God did that in the past. That's awesome. And just stay that way. But when we read stories, when we hear about stuff like that, it should stir up a hunger, a zeal, a desire for us, in us and, and that says that it is possible for these things to be experienced in the here and now. To see revival in our nation, in our city, in our church, in our lives, we need transformation. We need to think differently. We need to think the way he thinks. These two things go, to, uh, go together. I'm making sense. Making sense. And so that, that is honestly the, the endeavor of uh, my life for you know, however months, years it, it takes to discover what uh, Jesus thinks, to, to discover how he is like you know, through the word of God and see it modeled and see it uh, established in my life. Amen? If we think of like heaven as like a, a, the, 
we, if we think from the perspective of like a greenhouse effect, how many of you know what, not a greenhouse effect, like a greenhouse, right? How many of you know that what conditions you establish in a greenhouse will determine what grows in the greenhouse? If we apply that to how we view heaven, what is in heaven, if we can establish the atmosphere of heaven in our midst, perhaps we could see the realities of heaven present in our midst as well. Am yeah, I making sense? How many of you know that honor is present in heaven? Everything in, in heaven revolves around that concept of honor. Every song you know you read in the book of Revelations has the word honor in it. The saints, the elders, the angels, they honor the Lord. Heaven is an atmosphere pregnant with honor. If we talk about establishing heaven on earth, that's the very atmosphere we ought to see on earth. Heaven is pregnant with that which is honor. You know, last, last week I read a verse from 1 Timothy. Can we have uh, that verse up? 1 Timothy. Uh, a couple of weeks ago I talked about controversy. And, and no, we've been reading uh, this verse often because it's on Facebook a lot. And it goes like this. Now I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And this is almost like a four-point sermon. And it's almost like the Lord through Paul gives us the strategy, gives us the formula for what uh, uh, godliness, what peace and what an uh, 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 atmosphere of holiness, that formula which brings us to that place. And he says this, you know, petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanks even be made for all people, specifically for kings and all those in authority. I would like to sum up that first two lines to say that what Paul is essentially saying to us is honor. Practice honor. Honor leaders, honor people in authority. Do that so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Some time ago, I preached a sermon on peace. And we know this peace is not the absence of conflict, it's the presence of a person. Kingdom peace is the presence of Jesus. It says it's the prince of peace that crushes the head of Satan. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but peace is the presence of Jesus. And with Jesus comes the authority to crush every conflict. And it says this, you know, when we honor, when we choose to practice this thing, it leads to us living peace-filled lives in all godliness. My suggestion to you this morning is that if you want to see more of the kingdom of God in our midst, we need to understand and we need to practice this thing called honor. Am I making sense? Are you alive? We are all familiar with the term honor, I would suppose, you know. We hear it in Mulan, you know, you bring your family this honor. You know, we, we see it all around. It's very prevalent in our Asian culture, you know. And, um, but how many of you know that what is culturally acceptable might not always be biblical? Amen. What is uh, the societal norm might not always be a uh, kingdom. You know, the dictionary de defines honor as this, to hold in high esteem or respect, to hold in high esteem and respect. But I'd like to shed some light on what biblical honor is. If we look at uh, the, where the word honor comes from, it actually comes from this practice. And this practice is this, the practice of taking gold shackles, taking gold pieces, and putting the weight to countermeasure. We all see movies, right? They take the weight and then they measure okay, the gold pieces. And the more the amount of weight, the more value it is, right? That practice of attaching weight to value is what is called honor. Honor in a nutshell means this, to put weight or value towards something. The world has defined honor differently. It defines it as holding in high esteem, respecting. You know, it's almost like that person has to do something in order for me to honor. But biblical honor is different. Biblical honor almost puts us in the position to make the choice to honor. Honor is this. Honor is me putting value and worth on something. It's my choice. It's not a byproduct of someone's ability, not a byproduct of someone's accomplishment. It is my choice to put value and worth on something. That is what is biblical honor. I'm making sense. The first miracle was recorded in, in John 2, and we have uh, the scripture up. 
John 2, and it goes like this. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding where the wine was gone. Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. And Jesus, uh, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Next slide. They did also, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. My suggestion to you this morning is that that first miracle was a byproduct of honor. In that cultural context, to run out of wine in a wedding was an extremely shameful and disgraceful thing. I won't go into that, that, but believe me, it's an extremely shameful and disgraceful thing. And Jesus' mother then pipes up and was like, Jesus, you got to do something about it. And then Jesus replies like, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Can you imagine saying that to your own mother when she asks you to do something? It's like, Andre, go clean the room. Woman, what are you? Don't try that. You, you will get spanked as a 27-year-old. That's what, what happens. But, but Jesus, you know, even, even though he felt that it was not his hour, you know, probably had his reasons, he still chose honor. He still chose to honor his mother. And then afterwards, the servants okay, honored the words of Jesus because the mother was like, do what he ever tells you. And Jesus gives, gives a specific set of, set of instructions and they honored it. And that whole story of honor was what led to the first miracle. Because they put weight and value on the words that were spoken. Jesus put weight and value to the words of his mother. And the servants put weight and value to the words of Jesus. That was what brought about the first miracle. But I, I wouldn't stop there. I would say that every miracle in the Bible was a byproduct of honor. Honor means this to put weight and value toward something. Yes? Do we agree on that? Every miracle in the Bible was a byproduct of honor because of this. It was because someone put weight and value on the words of Jesus, on the reputation of Jesus, and that stirred in them faith for their miracle. It was what created that miracle. Every miracle was a byproduct of honor. It was a byproduct of Jesus even honoring the cries of people who were in, in, in dark situations, people who were oppressed. He honored them. He put weight and value to their cries, to the words from their mouth, and that produced the miracle. Honor is the key to miracles. Honor is the key to breakthrough. Honor is the key to provision. The Bible uh, admonishes believers to honor specifically your father and mother so that you may have long life. Honor produces life. We've all been in, I would say, most of us have probably encountered atmospheres of great dishonor, right? You know, people just don't treat each other right. People step over each other. There's a bunch of backstabbing. Unpleasant situation. Unpleasant atmosphere. How many of you would say that that atmosphere is an atmosphere of life? You wouldn't say that, right? It almost feels weary, uh, weary it almost feels burdensome. Am I making sense? Yeah? The Bible says this. The Bible says that you and I are called to be vessels of honor. Specifically, it says that we are to be cleansed, set aside to be vessels of honor, to be useful to the master. We were made for the purpose of honor. And because we were made to function in that manner, we were made to thrive in honor as well. To be in an atmosphere of dishonor is death to the believer. Because we were made, we were purposed for this mission, for this mandate to bring honor onto the earth. Am I making sense? Come on, help me. Thanks, Gideon. We were made for honor. The reason you are saved today is because you honored. You put weight and value to what Jesus said. 
And as a result, Jesus honored you as well. He honored your confession. The way to you being saved was the way of honor. The Bible says is that we ought to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Right? That word work out means to continually do. If it is by the way of honor that we enter salvation, then my suggestion to you is that the way we ought to live out our lives post-salvation experience is the way of honor as well. Let's just jump to my sermon title, okay? <laughs> my sermon title this morning is A People of Honor. A People of Honor. I believe we are called to live that way. I believe that is... Well, you only cheer for the... Okay? I guess that, that's how it is. Thank you. You know, most of us, when we hear the word honor in a church, it often uh, almost, uh, we confuse the word honor with submission, right? You know, I'm sure, you know, for some of you growing up in church, growing up with, uh, you know, parents and leaders, uh, you'll hear this phrase like, hey, don't be dishonoring, honor me. Essentially, in a nutshell, what they're saying is, listen to what I'm saying and do what I'm saying. Honor and submission, right? They, we confuse the two things together. It's like, it's almost one and the same. We confuse honor and respect as well, right? Can I put it to you that respect can be earned or lost, but honor is unconditional. Honor is unconditional because the Bible commands us to honor, commands us to be on the purpose of honor. And so it becomes unconditional. It becomes not an option for the believer. You're making sense. Yes? As a young man, I remember that all of us desired to be leaders because leaders had their backs carry, leaders don't need to buy food from the food court, everyone served leaders, and all of us were, were really, um, yeah, we all wanted to be leaders because leaders was, were, were very honored. You see, here's the thing about kingdom honor. I believe that kingdom honor, you know, uh, submission to leaders, respect to leaders is part of it. But to me, it's a very small part of this thing called honor. It's almost like, you know, if you ask me to describe my father, and I say, oh, my father, he is a disciplinarian to me. Though it's true, but it's not the full picture. There are many facets to my father's role in my life. Disciplinarian is one of them, but it's not the full truth. Likewise, if we say honor equals to submission and respect, we are totally missing the point. It's a very small part in a big, big uh, summons that you and I are called to walk in. There's so much to honor that you and I are called to discover. Good, yeah. Amen? Yeah. Likewise, honor is, is not just the interaction between followers, two leaders, children, two parents. I'd like to make a comment about submission. I'd like to say this. If you are properly submitted to authentic spiritual authority, you, are, you won't always be able to do what you want. But you will be able to do more than you are capable of doing. In the kingdom, submission looks like that. And we become submitted to his commission, to be co-mission under the, the, the commandment, under the mission of Jesus. We get empowered by his Holy Spirit. And that is what submission ought to look in your life and mine. Submission is not about dying to yourself and being suppressed. Submission comes with empowerment. It comes with you being able to do more than you are capable of doing. Because you choose the way of honor. You choose to respect. You choose to put yourself in that position. And with that comes a reward. God honors honor. Let's look at First Peter. I, I have a verse. I mean, follow me, yes? Yeah? It goes this, uh, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners, pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whatever, whatever, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Next slide. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now that's a good verse. How many of you know ignorant, foolish men? Okay. Definitely not here, elsewhere. As free, yet not losing liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. Now catch this. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. When I first read that verse, I went to um, study the, the Greek, the Hebrew. I went to try and find the, 
the um, original text. I went to read different commentaries to figure out whether all really meant all. And I have news for you this morning. All really does mean all. <laughs> the, the Bible commands us to honor all people. And, and that is, uh, that's extremely challenging because here's the thing. Whenever I look at honor, I, I looked at it as the practice between someone who is lesser to someone who is greater, right? Honor equals to me hoeing someone who is greater than me in high esteem and respect. But the Bible seems to suggest a different thing. The Bible seems to suggest that you and I are called to honor all people. That means to say this. That means to say that in every interaction, no matter who the person is, good, bad, deserving, not deserving, we are called to honor. It is to be the fundamental operating system of the believer. That's, that's frightening. That's shocking. Because we all know people who in our definition, are not deserving of honor. They, they, they are not worth it, right? We, in, in our great discerning ability, discern that this fella is not worthy of any honor, right? Now, I, 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 it, it comes to mind this, that, that whole scene when Jesus was on the cross next to two thieves. Remember that scene, yeah? And, and, uh, and one thief, you know, uh, in a, a last-ditch effort to save himself, suddenly, all of a sudden, he, he recognized Jesus. He's like, oh my gosh, you're the Christ. And Jesus looks at him and said, well, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, um, scholars believe that that thief was, was not really like a common petty thief, but that thief was actually a political revolutionary. We have a modern-day term for someone like that, a terrorist. Someone who wouldn't... Uh, wouldn't even think twice to resorting to violence to get their political agenda met. And Jesus turns to this man who has done absolutely nothing for him, who is not deserving of a single thing. He looks at him, and because of his words, Jesus chose to honor him in that moment, and he was saved, and he is going to be in paradise. We're going to meet him one day. And that's offensive to us, right? Because we, we've done the Christian thing. We have served, we have done a lot for the kingdom of God, Right? It's offensive. But that's what we're called to walk in, that, that, that pain, that... that uh, we're called to do that. Because here's the thing. You and I, we don't get to determine the value or worth of a person anymore. Because this is what Jesus did. Jesus on the cross determined the worth of every human being. The price that he's paid was his life. And because of that, humanity, every single person, they are worth is determined by what Jesus purchased for them on the cross. Today, every single human being is valuable, is of worth. And that is why we live lives of honor. That is why we pursue this thing called honor. Because honor is this. Honor is the recognition and it's the communication of value and worth to an individual. And that value and worth is not predicated or it's not determined by what a person does or what a person has accomplished, but it's determined by what Jesus has accomplished and purchased for that individual. That is honor. That is honor. The word glory in the Bible, um, the actual word that's used is the word kabot. And we all know the word kabot. Kabot means weightiness. It it, is used to describe glory, right? Whenever we see the word kabot, instantly we think glory. But kabot translates to another word in the Bible. And that's the word honor. Kabot is used to describe glory as well as honor. I'd like to expand your definition of what honor is this morning. Honor is the recognition of glory in another. Honor is the recognition of glory in another. Am I making sense? It's when we recognize who a person is in Christ, you recognize what Christ has purchased for that individual. We recognize the value that Christ has for the individual and we choose to intentionally treat the person worthy of that value, worthy of that honor. That making sense? Yes. Honor all people. That's why Jesus, Matthew 25, says this, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Uh, this, his disciples says, says, says this to Jesus. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you as a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to him, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. When we choose to honor, we do it unto him. A true display of honor is this. When we choose to value people who have done nothing for us, may not do anything for us, or are 
not capable of punishing us for a lack of honour. That's what honour is. The very act of honour wars against criticism, comparison and competition. It destroys it. To me, honour is one of the key attributes of a matured and secured person because honour seeks to celebrate a person, esteem a person higher than oneself. Honour is different from flattery. Flattery pays lip service in order to service a personal agenda. Honour is a selfless act that seeks to esteem someone higher than oneself. It does not have any strings attached. That is what honour is. And you and I, we have this great privilege on this planet to display to the world what true honour is. It is not determined by what a person has accomplished, not determined by what a person will do for you. But honour is the communication of worth and value. Honour is the recognition of glory in another. Glory demands a response from us. Think about it. Glory demands a response from us. I'm just going to wrap up here and I want to talk about three effects of honour. Everybody say three. Three effects of honour. I know this is heavy, but help me preach. Amen. First thing I think honour honor does. I believe honour affirms value. Honour affirms value. And I, I won't need to read the scripture, but you all know but the story of the woman with issue of blood. You know, she uh, was uh, alienated, ostracized, uh, outcasted for 12 years because of uh, that issue of blood, which was perceived by the religious elite as some, a person of unrighteousness, a person of sin. And she was... Uh, pushed out and, and alienated. Nobody had any regard for her. But when she heard of Jesus, this healer who, who came in the city, she risked being thrown into prison. She risked being killed, honestly, so that she could touch the helm of his garment, so that she could be healed. She put weight and value on the words of Jesus, on the reputation of Jesus. And what did Jesus do in the moment when he, she touched him in the midst of a crowd? You know Think about it. Right? Everyone was crowding around Jesus. Like he was being crowded. Everyone was probably touching him. But in that moment, he felt something. Yeah. To a woman who was alienated, ostracized, outcast, nobody had any regard for her. In the midst of the crowd, Jesus stops, turns, and recognizes her. Recognizes that act. And chose to honor her in that moment. Put weight and value in that very act. And that released a miracle. Honour is the affirmation, the recognition of value. I'm going to demonstrate honour by talking about Sir Alex Ferguson. It's tearing me apart. <laughs> so I, I, I came across this uh, lecture that uh, Sir Alex did and um, someone asked him the question, Sir Alex, what do you wish you would have known some 30 years ago, before you started managing. And this was what he said, extremely profound. He said, I wish I knew how to communicate recognition. I wish I knew how to communicate recognition. That's honour. Honour is this. Honour, a culture of honour, an organisation of honour looks like this. It looks like Everyone is valued. It looks like everyone is worth something. From the cleaner to the CEO, to the managers, to the admin staff, everyone is valued. Everyone is worth it. Everyone has contributed. So that trophy that's lifted up, it's not just the players that earn it, but the ladies who clean up the towers, the ladies who wash the jerseys, everyone collectively have played a part to seeing that happen. It's the communication of recognition. That is honour. That's what you and I are called to walk in. One of the saddest verses in the Bible is found in Mark 6 and it's the story of Jesus going back to his hometown and it said that Jesus could do no miracles in that town. As he entered the town, you know, uh, you must understand Jesus grew up in that town so he would know everyone who has uh, different ailments, conditions, maybe Auntie Sally down the street who has a knee condition. Jesus would know all of this, right? He came back probably, you know, with Great, a great heart of expectation to see uh, his relatives, to see uh, his fellow uh, villagers uh, healed. And so he came back and they looked at him and they, and they, they said, you know, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of Jesus, uh, James, Jose, Joseph, Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us, so they were offended with him. Familiarity kills the move of God. Familiarity kills the move of God. 
I put it to you that Jesus could do no miracles. Primarily, yes, in our Bible accounts for this, that he couldn't do any miracles because of lack of faith. But I'd like to suggest to you that there was no faith in that village in that day because there was no honor. There was no honor. The atmosphere of faith is produced by honor, by putting weight and value on something and making sense. It's a sad day in eternity where we realize that some of the breakthrough we've been crying for out for was locked up in the person sitting next to us. Familiarity kills the move of God. The next thing I believe honor brings, honor creates value. Honor creates value. We all know the story of Zacchaeus. You know, uh, can we have that, that slide up? <clears throat> no, it's not this one. Yep, there we go. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich and he sought to see who Jesus was but could not because of the crowd for he was, short, he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and he received him joyfully. But when they saw it, the, the, the people, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Next slide. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. See, tax collectors in that day, um, they... Uh, you know, were uh, Jewish people, but they worked for the Roman governor. Okay, so they worked for the Roman governor. They were, they went about collecting taxes for uh, Caesar. Even though they were working for the Roman authorities, they were also despised by the Roman authorities. And to the Jewish people in that day, they looked at the tax collectors as uh, slaves, as people who were against the Jewish community, slaves to the Roman uh, Empire. And they were also ostracized by the old people. And so you have a person here who was ostracized, who was hated in, uh, by both groups of people, by the Romans and by his own people. And the Jewish people often refer to tax collectors as the chief, chief of all sinners. This guy was the chief tax collector. Nobody liked him. Everybody hated him. Nobody wanted to spend time with him. But Jesus, when he saw Zacchaeus, he chose to honor him and said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come to your house today. And look what was produced because of that act of honor. Zacchaeus, a man, okay, who was probably, you know, uh, after wealth, who was probably a, after amassing loads of money, he says this, look, Lord, I will give half my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. There's something about honor when it's done rightly. There's something about honor that causes a shift in a person's life. Because here's, here's the thing, we always function from who we believe we are. And because Zacchaeus experienced value, Zacchaeus experienced affirmation from he who is the Lord of all, it produced this thing in him that created this almost radical shift, radical repentance from the life that he used to live. Honor creates value. Jesus valued Zacchaeus by his honor. And that produced repentance. How many of you know that honor is an expression of spiritual hunger? Honor is an expression of spiritual hunger. You know, I go up to leaders all the time and ask to be prayed for and ask for a prayer impartation. Uh, because of, of this, you know, when I was a really young boy, I wanted to sing. I wanted to be a worship leader. And uh, then one of my leaders told me that um, perhaps you shouldn't sing or lead worship because you're not gifted to do so. Uh, I think you'll make a great usher. And I was like... It's not like, oh, ushers cannot sing. La. That's not what I'm saying. But my leader thought like, I would fit really well in the usher ministry. And uh, I remember um, we had a guest speaker in my, my cell group meeting one day. And uh, he was a great, great worship leader. And I asked to be prayed for. I was like, you know, uh, can you pray for me? I really want to lead worship. And, um, and uh, I, I recognized that there could be power in the prayer. I wasn't very sure. And when he prayed for me, I, I felt almost nothing in that moment. But I remember from that day onwards, for some reason, I could play the guitar better. I could lead worship. Somehow I could sing better. And that was all she wrote. Here's the point. 
most of us look at prayers like this as that there's this magical transference of power, right? You know, person has like this like bank of power and it and how a bit of it gets depleted and goes to you. I don't think it works that way. I don't think it works that way. I believe God honors honor. The Bible says this when we honor a prophet, we re- receive a prophet's reward. That act of honor, the act of recognition, the act of spiritual hunger is what produces a release from heaven itself. Not from the person to you, but God honors you because you chose to honor someone else. You chose to put weight and value on the gift, on the anointing of God, on someone else. Honor is the recognition of that. Honor is an expression of spiritual hunger. I'm making sense. Last one I want to talk about. Honor restores value. Honor restores value. And we have that verse John 21. And this was uh, Jesus talking to Peter. Jesus uh, had already been resurrected. And we all know Peter, uh, before Jesus crucified, Peter uh, had that, that, that massive fall, right? You know, he denied Christ a bunch of times and he no doubt had failed. And Jesus you know, says this to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than this? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Next slide. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Then Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. For most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wish. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This is spoke signifying by what death he will glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. I bring out that passage of scripture because of this. You know, if I were Jesus in that moment, I encountered Peter who has been following me for a bunch of time. And I know that Peter denied me a bunch of times as well. I think I would bring that up at some point in the conversation, yeah? You know, like, yeah, Peter, so what was that whole rooster crow deny me thing business? Like, tell me your process, you know? I would talk about that, right? I'd be like, yo, you know, that, that wasn't very cool, but still love you, you know? But Jesus completely sidesteps that, 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 that issue almost, yeah? You don't see any uh, record of that in the Bible. Here's what honor does. Honor celebrates who a person is without stumbling over who a person is not. Honor does that. We all know the story of the prodigal son, yeah? He squandered the wealth of his father. He came back. And what did the father give him? The father gave him the best robe in the house, which we all know is, is the father's robe. The father gave him his best robe. And then the father proceeded to give him this. He gave him the signet ring. And here's what the signet ring would mean in that day. The signet ring would give the person the authority to manage the finances of the household. Get this, the prodigal son spent, squandered, wasted the wealth of his father. And yet when he returned, the father gave him the authority, he gave him the the responsibility of managing wealth. Doesn't make sense in our economy, yeah? We think person needs to go through like some financial 101 classes in order to get back uh, the responsibility. But honor looks at it differently. Honor celebrates a person's worth and value because of who the person is, not by what the person has done or what the person is going to do. Honor is restorative. It restores value. On the cross, Jesus Christ attributed value and worth to all of us. We who were sinners, we who were worthless, we who were deserving of death, he chose to honor. And because of the price he paid for us on the cross. Now you and I are worth something. Now you and I are valued. Now you and I are honored. And over the next few weeks, we'll discover what it means to be a people of honor. We'll discover what it means to honor God. How do you honor a God who has everything? And how do we honor people? How do we celebrate their value and worth? How do we lovingly correct? How do we give feedback in order to see them uh, walk into their fu- the fullness of their God-given destiny. How do we honor people around us? So I encourage you to join me on this journey as we discover what it means to be a people of honor. Amen. Can we stand? You know, for many years when I we talked, uh, when people talked about the glory of God, I used to think of the glory of God as someday some smoke is going to come into this room. There will be a holographic image of Jesus. They go like, "Oh, I am here." 
You know, I, I, used, to, I used to think of it that way. I don't know. I, am I the only one? How many of you think of the glory of God that way? Yeah? I don't know. There's this verse that troubles me often. And it goes like this. You know, that in the last days, uh, the glory of God will cover the whole earth as the waters cover the sea. What does that look like? You know? I don't think the whole earth is going to be covered with, with smoke. You know, but the Bible also talks about this. The Bible talks about how you and I carry a glory. It says that Christ in us is the hope of glory. You and I carry a, a, a glory. And I think the great endeavour of the Christian is this, is to discover the glory of God in the people on our right, on our left, to discover the glory of God, to discover His nature, to discover who He is, even in the least of this, to choose to honour, to choose to put worth and value on a person you normally wouldn't. Because in doing so, you respond to His glory. And I believe in doing so, you see a manifestation of Him. I believe because we are uniquely formed and created, we carry a unique revelation of who God is that will not be carried by another human being. Because of that, we are called to honour all. Part of me wonders if honour, the recognition of glory, is to be the fulfilment of that verse. In the last days, the knowledge of the glory of God will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. We're called to live such lives of honour. Now I know this for a fact that you can't give away what you don't have. You can't give away what you don't have. And um, I want to pray for a very specific group of people if, even as we end today. You know, one of my pet peeves is that I compliment someone. I was like, hey, you did a very good job. And the person will tell me, oh, it's not me, it's Jesus. I mean, we met someone like that. If I ever do that, slap me in the face. <laughs> because this is, this is the truth, you know. If it was Jesus, I think it would have done a much better job than you did. Like, <laughs> like don't overrate yourself, sir. <laughs> it's not that good. <laughs> it's good, lah. <laughs> Right, you know, we, we're like, oh, you know, uh, don't, uh, it's not me, it's Jesus, give glory to him. If we do not learn how to receive honour, we have no crown to throw at his, at his feet. If we do not learn how to receive honour, we have nothing to throw at his feet. You can only give what you have received. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot here, but here's how I respond to someone honouring me. When someone gives me a compliment, I would put my hand on my chest. I would bow ever so slightly. And I'll say, thank you. Most of you have probably seen it at some point. I'll be like, thank you. Uh, I, I receive the honour. But what I do is this. I, I go in private. And I, and I, I tell him, I tell God, that you are deserving of all honour and glory. Thank you for using my life. Thank you for gifting me in that manner. But now, you have the honour and glory. And it's almost as though I become like a, a middleman almost. I receive the honour here. And then I go to him and I cast that crown at his feet. If you do not learn how to receive honour, you have nothing to give him. And some of you, you know, um, in, in your lives and you know, be in your interaction with church leaders, pastors. I know there's a bunch of you that came from different churches. Maybe at some point in your life you've been okay with this honor. Someone have told you that you're not valuable, that you're worthless. Maybe you have experienced that. You know, maybe you have even come into agreement with that lie that I do not carry any worth or any value. I'm to be dishonored. Can I tell you that the cross of Jesus Christ has a better word? The cross of Jesus Christ says that you are worth His life. You are worthy. You are valuable. You belong. And even as we close uh, this morning, I want every eye closed, every head bowed. I want to pray for a very specific group of people. If in your life, you've experienced dishonor, in your life, someone has told you that you do not carry value. You, you are not worth something. If in your life, someone has told you that you will amount to nothing, be it a teacher, a parent, or a pastor. Today, I believe God wants to break that trauma. I believe God wants to release His worth, His value, His affirmation, His recognition of who you are. 
And this is essential because we can't give what we don't have. To be a people of honour, we need to know that we are honoured and loved by the King of Kings.